Art is always having a, a function in Malaysia and Polynesia. Okay, that's just straight up. It has a function. It has a, a it's a tool and a vehicle to create a transaction and uh, see it from an outsider's point of view. You put that thing in the middle, it comes the mediator or the starting of a story or provoking a story. It's so important what art does. The different mediums I use, sculpture, using tin, uh, painting, watercolour, I love watercolour. Uh, I do traditional carving, I did that for years with my uncle up in the Hook Islands. Music, lighting, installation, yeah. It's not chopping and changing, it's just all these beautiful mediums that are out there that can be used to tell a story or to, tell, you know, to use as a vehicle to prompt something. When I was young, I couldn't talk, read or write. My form of communication was just through visuals, like drawing pictures. My mum worked at the government house where she was the cleaner there, and basically she used to bring all that computer paper. And I don't know if you remember, it used to like folds of it. And she, she would probably raid their cupboards for the pens, and would fight over them. So that was my form of communication. I used to draw all over the stance when I was a kid. I used to stress out quite a bit because I would struggle with the confidence to write a letter. So what I used to do is like try and buy the lowest denominations of the stamps and uh, try and create an art piece and draw around it. Elderly people, they're like hard drives. And so by creating these stamps, there'll be questions like, I remember those stamps, but I've seen them before. And I don't remember seeing Aotearoa or any of that sort of thing. Yeah, it was, it was one of those memory things, but I wanted to hear people's own stories, and I put the stamps by changing the text, but making st the stamps really familiar. Because uh, I had good friends in the post office, and they were feeding me back, and they said it was actually quite hilarious, because they'd be looking to see, well, I want that new series, that old school series that I see, but they've all got Maori names on it. <laughs> <laughs> So the bull, that actually has a lot to do with um, how much that animal has actually destroyed the landscape because the hooves weren't designed for the soil. But also impacted on our people because 80% of women, just so one example, in Samoa have diabetes. Okay, so that's processed food. But when you look at the can and look at the landscape, how that thing sits on the can and even the colours, the semiotics behind it, it actually has now replaced a lot of our foods that we used to eat in a raw state. Why are we eating this food? Like tin fish, for example, is no different. You know, we live next to the sea, we eat tin fish. It just sounds so bloody ridiculous. I mean, I worked up in the Solomon Islands for eight years. We'd be in the rainforest and we'd be eating tin fish with noodles. It's not our diet. And this is the reason why we have these health problems. So that thing is just a vehicle to, uh, to create conversation. And there's been all these interesting characters on this island that I've met that have actually made this whole residency so comfortable, it's not funny. This whole par journey in the, looking in, the, in their rubbish bin or looking for the shells on the par sites has started. So that's where I've started on this journey par sites or land formations that has been altered by human beings. You can read this, uh, what activity has been going on just by looking at the erosion of the landscape and actually how it's uh, changed. Even just standing on it, just standing on it and having a moment and reflecting, then go home and read about it and then you go back there again. So was, uh, that's what I've been doing since I arrived here at Waiheke, just like reflecting. You've just got to sit and just be quiet and just listen, <laughs> you know, and you have your moment, yeah. These shells here are some of them from the, the par sites, like from the rubbish bin, uh, you know, from the middens. So what I've been doing is after the story about those kids and those, uh, the women that were slaughtered, 
but one of Hickey's mates down at uh, Onatangi. I started carving out all these skulls on the shells, on the cockle shells, just after that incident, that genocide. So what I'm doing is like again, just collecting sh different shells all from the different beaches around here, then drawing up my um, visual response to it. And if you look at the lines, okay, so you use them like the tree rings. They tell they they tell you the story. Like doing these images really quickly, nothing formal, but just playing around with the color, the, the coloration, using the shells as the metaphor to tell the story. Remember the rings. And then started reading through all the stories of the different beautiful, you know, tall ships, the walkers arriving here, but still keeping that landscape in the background. You remember the rings on there? And then the Onatangi story, that was the sad one. You know, I know it's a dark story, but at the same time, it's, you know, that's what this whole journey's about. I've been able to go on the exploration with my painting, but then also keep, give it a, a corridor with my mahi that I'm doing here and that connection, that cultural connection, because I don't think a lot of people realise the closeness and the relationship between Rotonga, Taiti, and here. We did have stopovers, but I started tracking the walkers or the canoe technology, because it only takes 22 days to arrive here in Aotearoa, and that's just taking your time, from Araiatea to here to Aotearoa. The thing about the Pacific, don't make out that, you know, we don't have this connection just because the water divides, it doesn't divide us, it actually brings us closer. Just shows you how sophisticated we are. So looking into Waiheke history here, this is the other BP station. The very first one is Nortunga. You do the stopover from there, from Araiatea, which is in French Polynesia. That's the main terminal, if you imagine Dubai or LA, that's where the departure now is. And then they come down to Nortunga, stop over there, resupply. And then they come here to Waiheke, and Waiheke is the next BP station. Aboriginal mate uh, Richard Bell from Australia, he said to me one time, he says, all you bloody Maoris, you're all fucking colonisers. And I, we had an argument, this is in a bar, and then I actually came to the realisation, yeah, actually we are, because if you really think about this place, Waiheke is the BP station, there's been all these people trying to colonise each other. And if you want evidence, of colonizers colonizing each other, that it's actually here on this island. So we're talking about the people from Waikato, Toy and his mates, and then you've got Honiheke from up north, Napui, and then you can track the walkers going to Te Arawa, and then you've got Raiatia, Rotunga. So there's all these layers. This is before even the Pākehā arrived. And then the Pākehā arrived, and then there's the next form of colonization. The day that Wallace fired that cannon, you know, in Tahiti, and wiped out all those people, you know, and it's a really graphic image. If you can imagine this big giant cannonball ripping through a whole lot of kids and people, that's where that that, that whole concept of like I don't care about other human beings, you know, this this that mentality. And I think sometimes when I look at the English people or when the foreigners come here, they seem to suffer from amnesia about pre-contact, what actually happened to us and what's, you know, because it's, and it's that form of like racism, it's sort of like they don't really understand what's happened. From my experience for, with the church and where it is now and what it's done, it has, has done some good stuff where it's actually stopped the violence. Okay, and that's just to be straight up. We had a lot of violence here in Aotearoa and if you read the history, especially here in Waiheke, thank God the church turned up because Marsden was trying to stop the slaughtering that was going on. And then you go and talk to people down like uh, Monty Suta down in Gisborne, and he talked about the violence that was going on there. And people, because people were under constant stress. You know, you didn't know whether you were going to get eaten and that sort of can. So if you just imagine that, that's what the church did. It actually eventually stopped the violence. What hurts the most is the hypocritical side of it. The church is used as a screen here, and I'm used in the South Pacific as a screen to collect money. And it's the dark side I don't really like. There's some great aspects about the church, but there's some dark sides that actually need to still need to be sorted out. And I've seen villages 
break apart just because of the behavior of the Faifiao in Samoa, for example. You know, we've got 2,500 churches in Samoa, five per village. The guilt trip is what I, I, I can't handle anymore. So that's why I've gone back to looking at middens and the rubbish bins up into the past sites or the marae, because for me that's actually our history and we can actually start finding ourselves going on that journey again. And again, the church does, there's a lot of great, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of great things the church has done, but there's a lot of things that have taken away linguistically or behavior or custom that have changed, have been put on us. So as the art side of things, I've been using that as a vehicle to contest some of those, those concepts and those ideas. Because I was a Christian then, but then my world started to fall apart when I went back to Samoa because I've been to Samoa as a child and I realised actually how much religion was just used as a screen or a way to control people in the, their own individual villages. And I saw what it did to the families, which that's what hurt the most. And so I had to do something about it, so I just basically did this piece. That's what that, that whole piece is about. It's just questioning, you know, you know, just the way they treat or talk to the people. I, I found it quite intimidating, and then reading the people's names, who didn't get their money, who hasn't paid up for last, and I, that was just intimidating. So again, with the church, yeah, there's the, good, there's the good aspects and there's the bad aspects about it. And I'm not taking sides, but I know what, that, what, it, what it has done to the people, and, that, and that's denied a lot, of, a lot of information about our past. But thank God for the Germans because they're so articulate as far as collecting and keeping the linguistics going. That's been the best part. But I have to say the English have a lot to answer for because they persona that sort of carry on after the first war in Samoa, where the Germans had a really good system. Uh, they basically you had um, Samoans being spoken by the colonizers and also the uh, Samoa came first in the education system, but as soon as New Zealand turned up, see this is going to be a nice little re reawakening for New Zealand, they turned everything upside down. You have to speak English, you have to put some pants on. See there you go, there, and, it's, and, and, and it's in Michael Field's book, if you see that book about the mole movement at that time, where it actually was trying to get rid of the New Zealand administration, because they basically balls it up because they didn't know how. There was no intellectuals amongst that crowd running that country. And then you take the German period, we had professors and doctors and proper administrators who had to train three years before they came to Samoa. And I'm not taking sides with the Germans or the New Zealanders. No colonization's good, but that's the impact of what colonization has done to just one example of Samoa. And we didn't ask New Zealanders to come and protect the Cook Islands either. That was run through and there's a, there's a beautiful little sneaky way of taking over a country without even asking our people if uh, we wanted the New Zealanders to come and look after us. Because remember there was this whole race to take over the Pacific. The Matamata, okay, it's the ice. And the, the bomber was talking, that was actually the rescue package uh, what was going on over in the Cook Islands. So I was going backwards and forwards to the Cook Islands and it was all about the, the history of the Hercules that was actually going through the South Pacific because every time there's a cyclone, we do this. We wait for the, the divine bomber to turn up and feed us. Where in the past, it's like we just take the initiative and actually just deal with the problem then. But the, unfortunately, we've got into this, almost like when communism fell apart in Russia, they sort of didn't know what to do, like uh, when they couldn't get a, didn't get the income coming in. So if we were to take away the social welfare benefit here in Aotearoa, it would be interesting. And, and there's this whole concept, which I don't get, is like we owe them something. It's like we don't owe you anything. And I think it's, we've forgotten that whole thing about dignity, about trying to self-help, and just thinking about other human beings that are around. And when that first Hercules arrived in Rotonga, it changed everything, because the first plane arrived there in the 60s. Then our culture started to change. So it's almost like the new waka that it's actually, or the new waka that it's arrived. That's what that one's all about. I 
I saw this film about Vincent van Gogh who cut his ear off this film and I actually bawled my eyes out when I was 12 because I don't want to be like Vincent van Gogh, a victim living in a cave. That's what I thought my art career was going to be like, being a victim and being depressed, being mental. But it's been good mental and so there's this good side to it. So I know it sounds all like, ah, oh, that's great, great life, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. It's a hard life but it's a real life and you know that you've lived life to the max by just going somewhere uncomfortable.